afternoon. Thank you for the invitation and welcome to be with you today in Cowden Beath. We're going to read some verses from the Bible, as you would expect. Three sections from the book of Acts. So if you turn with me to Acts chapter 4, first of all, please. The book of Acts is in the New Testament section of the, the Bible. So if you if you start at the start of the New Testament, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the Gospel records. And then the next book after that is Acts. And we're looking, first of all, at Acts chapter 4 and verse number 10. We break into a story here where a man has been healed of his paralysis and Peter has been involved in that healing. God has done a miracle and there's now a, a conversation going on. Peter is speaking publicly and he's saying amongst these things, he says, as we're going to cut in at verse 10, Peter says, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man, that's the man who was paralyzed, does this man stand here before you whole? Let's skip to verse 12. It says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Over a few pages to Acts chapter 13, please. Acts chapter 13. Again, we're breaking into someone speaking here. It's Paul this time, and he says in verse number 38, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's the Lord Jesus, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And then finally, the last chapter of this book, so right to the end of the Acts in chapter number 28, and almost the last verse, it's verse 28, And Paul again speaking says, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Now these are the three sections we're going to look at. God will bless to us the reading of his word, we trust. And perhaps you'll have spotted the phrase right at the start of each of those readings, Be it known. So three times in this uh, part of the Bible, in this the book of the Acts, there's this little phrase, just three words, Be it known. And so God is communicating to us something that's essential for us to know. It's Peter and then it's Paul twice. And they go on and they say some things which are essential knowledge for everybody. For people then and for people today. What is it that we're needing to know then? Well, perhaps when it's Peter who's speaking, he's telling us what God has done. So the Lord Jesus Christ has died. He says, be it known the Lord Jesus Christ, you crucified him, but he died, and God has raised him from the dead. So you need to know what God has done. And then Paul is speaking, and he tells us not so much what God has done, but what God can do. That is, through the Lord Jesus, we can have the forgiveness of sins. That's so important for people to know that. Essential for you and I to know that, that we can have God's forgiveness. We can have the debt of wrongdoing cancelled if it is that we trust in the Lord Jesus. Essential knowledge. This is what God can do. And then if we think about the last verse that we read together at the end of this book, Acts chapter 28, it's maybe what God is doing, that is this message about salvation is being heard by many, many people. Not enough people, but nevertheless, many people are hearing about how the Lord Jesus can save now, there are some things that you and I just need to know, and hopefully you'll have been taught them right from an early age. You know, don't go flying a kite next to power lights. And be very careful about eating food that's not been cooked right. And, you know, there's a certain set of actions that you need to do when you're going to cross a road safely in order to avoid risk. You know, certain things that you and I we know as essential knowledge that we've been taught, 
If those three are new to you, then there's probably a whole list of other things you need to check out as well. You've missed a few things. You know, there's certain things that we just need to know. And it's important that we're taught them as early in life as possible if it is that we're going to avoid danger and risk and harm. Well, can I say, suggest to you here that these two speakers, Peter and then Paul, they are urging us that we should know certain things. And so we read together that Peter, in his second sermon, if you like, in, in Acts chapter 2, he stood famously and told a whole bunch of people in Jerusalem about how just a month and a half before they had crucified the Lord Jesus and it was a grave error that they were involved in, but it was God's plan in order that there might be a resolution to sin. And so Peter has spoken before publicly in this city of Jerusalem and he stands up again, maybe just in the same week, and he cuts he cuts straight to the chase and he gets to the most important point and he says, be this known you need to know this, he's saying, that Jesus Christ, the man who lived in Nazareth, who you know was crucified, well, God has raised him from the dead. Now, I suspect that actually there's very few people in our world that don't know the story of the death of the Lord Jesus. It's infamous, the fact that the Lord Jesus died on a cross in Jerusalem or just outside that city 2,000 years ago and there's very few people I suspect even nowadays where we would go and ask them about this and they wouldn't know anything about it. But God wants us to know a bit more than just the fact that Jesus died on a cross. He wants us to know, well firstly, that he died, he was buried and then he was risen from the dead as he promised would be the case. And so, important for you and I to know that Jesus Christ, not only did he die, but he's been raised by God in power, and he's alive just now in heaven. I wonder, does that mean anything to you? And you might think to yourself, well, that seems a bit far-fetched. This idea that a person could die and be actually fully dead, and then be raised back to life again, that seems a bit of a stretch. Well... Remember, with, all, with God, all things are possible. And the very fact that the Bible records things which seem impossible and implausible is evidence to the reality that God exists. But remember, Peter here is standing and he's in the very location, almost, where the Lord Jesus had been arrested and put on trial and sentenced to death and then ultimately had died outside the city of Jerusalem. It's the same city that Peter is in just now. And it's only a matter of months since these events had taken place. And Peter stands up and says, Jesus, he died and then God raised him from the dead. And nobody argues against him. You see, if it wasn't true, people could just have said to Peter, right, Peter, stop there. Let's go and we'll just take a walk just now to the tomb which is only like a mile away from where we are just now and we'll be able to see the body of the Lord Jesus and we'll be able to see inside that tomb that Jesus is still dead and so therefore what you're saying just now is absolute nonsense you've made it up but they couldn't because it was true and so here's Peter and he's standing in the very location where the Lord Jesus died and then was buried and then was seen to be alive again and if this thing was a lie, he wouldn't have got away with it. You know, see, when you come to the Bible, and when you come to God's Word, it's not myths and legends and fairy tales and fables. It's true stories about real places and real people. And Peter stands here in the very city where people had seen the Lord Jesus die a matter of months ago, and he says he was crucified, and he has died, but God has raised him from the dead. You know, this was essential for people to know then. It's essential for you and I to know just now that this was a great plan of God that yes, Christ died, but we're told later on in the Bible why he died. In a few books time it says, Christ died for our sins and he was buried and he rose again the third day. I wonder, do you believe that? It's essential that we know about this and it's important that we consider it and we decide whether we believe it to be true or not. But Peter continues, and he doesn't just say, well, this is an important event. He says, this is 
something that has an impact because going on from this he says verse 12 we read it together as a result of the fact that the Lord Jesus has died and has now been raised from the dead there's salvation available to everybody but he says there's conditions let's read the verse again he says neither is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You see, Peter is saying this. He's saying, not only do you and I need to know that the Lord Jesus died and then was raised from the dead, but it's important that we know that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. You know, that's something that many, many people in our country get mixed up about and it's not the case that you and I can come to know God in our own way it's not the case that we can follow on in the way that God would want us to do based on what we think is right and wrong and it's not the case that you and I can just select a religion that suits us best off the shelf and say well I'm going to live my life following these rules and these conditions no Peter is very specific here and he says as a result of the death of the Lord Jesus, because he died and he's been raised out from the dead, God is able to save, but you need to know this, he says, you can't find salvation in anyone else or in anything else. It's only in him and in no other way. The Lord Jesus said something similar to this when he was with the disciples. Peter was in the room with them. He said, the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's very narrow. He's the only option he's saying. And Peter repeats it here as he speaks publicly to this group of people this day. Now, there were people here and they didn't like that. They kind of heard what Peter was saying and they, they got a, an internal reaction as they heard it and they thought, I don't like this attitude that this man's coming across in. And I don't like this narrow mindset that he's got and they were essentially trusting in their own religious living to earn a place in heaven and so they just rejected what peter was saying as nonsense and it wasn't for them you know we should be very careful to not make the same mistake this is important for us to know be it known peter says that neither is salvation in anyone else and it's only through him that we must be saved this is an urgent business this i know that it may be the case that you come to this hall this church building here on a regular basis and you listen to what the bible has to say as people speak but you know this is urgent this is really important for you and i to consider this business of where we stand before god and whether it is that we have relationship with god at all and peter is earnestly saying to the people in this crowd today and if he was here in this hall he would be fixating on the same point this is something that we must sort out we must be saved i don't know what you're like when it comes to time management i was told years ago and it was good advice that when it comes to your tasks for for the day then it would be good for you to set out and work out the things that you must do the things that you should do and the things that you could do but they could you know be left till tomorrow and you would think as somebody working in the help service we've never really got to grips with that sort of attitude but I, I do try my best and you know if you have an organized mind when it comes to time management then you'll do well in so many ways in your life and this is a simple way to look at it do the things you must do first do the things you should do next and then leave the things that you could do till the end peter says this is something you must do can't put this off till tomorrow. Your relationship with God is something you need to sort out urgently. And we must be saved. You see, what does that mean, this idea of being saved? And the verse talks about salvation as well. Well, you know, we're not in any physical danger just now. There's not a fire and there's not a risk of drowning in water. When we think of people being rescued or saved, we're thinking of emergency incidents like that. There's not a physical um, risk or problem that we have just now, but there is a spiritual one, and there is 
the risk for us that we will face God and be punished for the wrongdoing that we've done, the sin that we've incurred during our life because of the fact that God is holy and God is just and God is standards. You know, we understand standards fine. I'm sure you've been watching the Olympics the last few days. You know, it's not the case that because you and I have maybe ran for a bus this week that we're good enough to go and qualify for the 100 metres. It's not the case because... You know, we've been able to throw something really far. We think recently we can go and try the short part of the javelin. You know, just because, as I was doing last week, I was throwing a ball in the swimming pool with my children, it doesn't mean I can go and try and get into the, the water polo team. You know, there's standards when it comes to so many things in our lives. Ten and a half seconds, I suspect, at the 100 metres for a man in order to qualify. Uh, under two minutes for 800 metres or thereabouts. There's maybe people in this room that would know better about these qualification standards than I do. But, you know, there's certain standards. Universities the same. Um, lots of teenagers would have got their results this week from their exams. If you want to go and do dentistry, it's five A's or whatever. Standards that you and I have to meet in order to hit the grade. Well, the standard God expects is, be ye holy for I am holy. That rules us all out. And so we're quickly coming to our next be it known in chapter 13. Paul says, be it known that through Jesus Christ is declared to you all the forgiveness of sins. I wonder, have we ever come to a point in our lives where we've had our sins forgiven? Have we ever trusted in the Lord Jesus and come to the moment where we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus has made peace by the blood of his cross. That because of the fact that he died on the cross and was judged and punished by God on account of sin and all this world's wrongdoing, then God now can move out and forgive people on a fair and just basis. You know, that's a tremendous thing. David reflects on this in the poetry section of the Bible, the Psalms, and he says, you know, blessed is the person whose transgressions are forgiven or whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. You know, for you and I, if it is that we have claimed forgiveness, which is available to us by trusting in the Lord Jesus, if we have that blessing from God, that free gift from God, then the result is that we're happy and we've got joy. Are you looking for happiness in life? Are you searching for things that make you happy and make life easier and more pleasant? There's nothing greater than knowing the forgiveness of God and the joy that comes from it. Paul says, you can have it. It's for everybody. He says, we can have the forgiveness of sins and it's for all that believe. God's offer of mercy goes out to absolutely every single person in the whole world without exception and so there is a potential for you and I through a decision that we make just now to trust in the Lord Jesus to leave this room in a different way altogether happy and joyous because our debt with God has been cancelled because we've trusted in Jesus the Lord Jesus and then we have God's forgiveness not only is it the case that Anyone can be forgiven if it is that we believe. But more than that, all things can be forgiven. You know, there's nothing that you and I have done in our lives that exclude us from being in heaven. Granted that the wrongdoing that we have done means that we'll never be in heaven. Nothing that defiles will ever enter into heaven, the book of Revelation tells us. But for each of us, there's this opportunity to trust in the Lord Jesus so that all of that wrongdoing which has offended God, can be forgiven and forgotten and removed. There's nothing too bad that excludes us from having a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus. You know, some people just get stuck a wee bit with that and they think, well, you know, the tragedy that's been involved in my life up until now is too bad that means that God wouldn't be interested in me. Well, this verse tells us that's not the case. Paul says to everybody in this crowd, and there was a lot of them, he says, it's declared to you the forgiveness of sins. By him all that believe are justified from all things. You know, there's great potential in this. 
Mind you, he reaffirms Paul here, he restates this fact that religious effort can't gain any favour with God at all. That's a little snippet at the end of the verse what he's getting at. He says, you know, the things that we the wrong things that we've done, they can be forgiven. The law of Moses was never able to do that. Essentially what he's saying is an attitude of mind where you're trying to keep God's law and obey God's rules. The law of Moses would never be you'd never be successful enough at it, and so don't even bother with it. Don't try to please God by being as nice as you can and be living as well as you could. It's not going to accomplish anything. Paul says, forget about all that sort of stuff. Forget about trying to pray your way to heaven. Forget about trying to be nice enough to gain favour with God and to somehow outweigh the balance of good and wrong in your life. He says, Turn to the Lord Jesus, believe in him, and you have forgiveness of sins. You know, this is essential for us to know and to realise that there is available to us this opportunity of having forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. Finally, and just to reaffirm much of what we've been saying here, in Acts chapter 28 we read, for completeness, this third occasion where this phrase is mentioned, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent out to the Gentiles. What has been said here by Paul is this, that this is a message for everybody. God wants you to hear it. God wants you to understand it, to know it. That there is salvation available from God through the Lord Jesus for everybody. I wonder, it's all very well knowing that salvation is for everybody. It's all very well knowing that everybody can be forgiven. You know, until you and I make it personal. Through faith in the Lord Jesus. It really has no impact on our life. And it makes no change to our eternal destination. It's all very well thinking, well, everybody can be in heaven. What's essential is that you and I know that we are going to be there through faith in the Lord Jesus. And to know that as a result of believing in him, we're no longer needing to fear facing the wrath of God and the judgment and punishment of God for our wrongdoing. But rather, we're in a position where all is good for the future. Essential for us to know these things. That we're accountable to God. That he's interested in everyone. But important that we hear what he has to say to us. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none another name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. I commend this person, the Lord Jesus, to you again. If you've never trusted in him, you're missing out. And it's important that you consider these things and claim God's forgiveness for your own by trusting in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ.